Good evening, I'm Carol McNeil, and this is The National. Before we can get to reconciliation, the truth has to be put out there. It has to get acknowledged. Indigenous activists bring a ceremonial teepee to Parliament Hill, but not without a struggle. Let us live! Let us live! BC's Liberal government is defeated. We follow the drama. Donald Trump's insulting tweets. Some Republicans say, enough. You need to stop acting like a mean girl. And we look back at a one-of-a-kind career in journalism. Peter Mansbridge, CBC News, Ottawa. Peter Mansbridge brought us the news for decades. We've got highlights and the historic moments. The Liberal government of Christy Clark has fallen, and British Columbia seems poised to have an NDP government. The CBC's Greg Rasmussen is at the legislature. Greg, quite the dramatic night. Take us through it. Well, the lieutenant governor's job is largely a ceremonial one, but tonight we're seeing the actual power of that position. Now, just to update you on what's happened, Earlier tonight, there was a vote in the legislature, and it went as expected. The NDP, with the support of the Greens, voted non-confidence in the existing Liberal government. So that government fell. And that means that Premier Christy Clark had to make a trip to Government House to meet with the Lieutenant Governor, and that's what she did. She was there for an hour or so talking. She then came out, she went to the microphone, and she basically said she wouldn't say what the decision was. She said she was going to wait until the Lieutenant Governor made that decision public. Then, shortly after that, we learned that NDP leader John Horgan had been summoned to Government House to meet with the Lieutenant Governor. Now, that means in almost any conceivable circumstance that John Horgan, the NDP, with the support of the Greens, will be forming the next government in British Columbia. And it is razor thin, so there will be lots of questions about how this might function going forward. But, uh, and he is uh, still meeting at this point with the Lieutenant Governor, but he's expected to come out, and then we'll start to hear more about the transition of power. All right, so the Speaker going forward could have quite a bit of power in that legislature if this all, if this all goes to that plan. Exactly. It comes down to a point where uh, they, the NDP will likely have to give up one of its members to go to, to uh, become the Speaker. And that would leave the House equally divided. And uh, so uh, that, there's, a, there's lots of discussion about that, what that means, what, what are the precedents, because all of this is based on tradition. There are no hard and fast rules along a lot of it, uh, about a lot of it, so we'll see how this all unfolds. But for the moment, the big news of the night is Clark's government has, has fallen, John Horgan has been summoned to talk to the Lieutenant Governor, and it appears we're headed for an NDP government in BC with the support of the Greens, which will uh, definitely be breaking ground in terms of policy in the weeks and months ahead. Greg Rasmussen, outside the BC Legislature, thank you. Parliament Hill is the focal point for this weekend's Canada 150 celebrations, but it's also become a flashpoint. Indigenous activists were held at the gates last night, told they couldn't access the traditional Algonquin territory. Security eventually gave way, but tensions boiled over this afternoon. Margot McDermott explains. It started when Indigenous activists tried to get onto Parliament Hill, carrying long poles to set up a teepee. Police and Parliament Hill officers stopped them at the gates. Both sides stood there for hours. Protesters wanted to use the hill for a four-day ceremony to highlight conditions Indigenous people still face on Canada's 150th anniversary. There's people from all, all parts of Canada that came here to put this teepee up for ceremony. And they won't even let us through the gates of Parliament Hill. What a disgrace! Nine people were arrested and then released. Early this morning, police allowed the teepee to go up in a corner of Parliament Hill. Security is high for Canada Day. Protesters didn't ask for permission normally needed to use the area, saying it's unceded Algonquin land. What we were met with last night was not acceptable. They claim police overreacted. We did not get 10 feet past those gates before two of my fellow friends were arrested and dragged off by fellow RCMP officers. And frustrations boiled over at a press conference this afternoon. No, stop it! 
Stop it right now. As the group berated reporters for the tone of their questions. Step out. Step out. Then I don't want to hear from you. You have no right. You don't speak to us like that. We're the ones that are dying. It's not you that is dying. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau tried to walk a middle ground, saying he understands how some people have a different view of Canada Day. I can understand the impatience uh, from, uh, from many people after uh, decades, uh, centuries of a broken relationship. I share that impatience. Visitors to the Hill say they're fine with the teepee. It's the right place. It's the right time. I think that... Uh... You know, you look for opportunities like special events to draw attention to your cause and uh, this is a perfect way for them to get their message out to all Canadians. Tonight, activists reached an agreement with the RCMP. They're moving their teepee further down, closer to the main Canada Day stage. They plan to stay there for the next three days. Margaret McDermott, CBC News, Ottawa. The federal government is committing more soldiers and more money to the mission against ISIS, a fight that will now extend at least until 2019. But as Murray Brewster explains, there's a concern the expanding mission won't be as hands-off as promised. Today, the Iraqi government declared the liberation of Mosul, or what's left of it, to be imminent. ISIS has almost been pushed out of Iraq. It is the moment war-weary Iraqis, Kurds and their Western backers, including Canada, have been working towards for years. The mission is almost accomplished. We know that Canada can, has and will uh, continue to do important work in our, uh, uh, in our uh, efforts in northern Iraq. Hold on a second. Canada will continue to do important work? The Liberal government chose today to extend the mission in Iraq by two years and redefine who the troops will be advising and assisting. More than 800 personnel are involved in the mission. The ground commitment has been focused on training Kurdish Peshmerga fighters for the operation to retake Mosul. Now, roughly 200 Special Forces instructors will look for training opportunities with Iraqi security forces, something the Americans have been doing. Uh, working with Iraqi forces will be problematic. Uh, the Iraqi military and security forces is, are heavily fragmented. Uh, some units uh, uh, follow or are more loyal to specific factions within the Iraqi government. Both the Iraqi army and the Kurds have been accused of human rights abuse. But most recently, it was an elite commando unit of the Iraqi army which was accused of torturing and executing civilians in Mosul. All of it captured through the lens of an Iraqi photojournalist with our coalition partners and making sure that we work um, with cr uh, credible Iraqi security forces and human rights will always be a paramount uh, focus uh, uh, for us. I want Mr. Trudeau to come and make his case to the elected officials in Parliament the way Mr. Harper did. So instead of being open and honest with Canadians, Mr. Trudeau by press release announces a two-year extension of what is by any definition, including Justin Trudeau's, a combat mission. The Liberals, however, argue that Parliament has already been consulted, and these are simply refinements to the existing mission. But there is still a lot that we don't know. For example, where else in Iraq would the troops operate, and what sort of danger would that entail? Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. And as Murray mentioned, ISIS is losing ground in Iraq and Syria, too. This map shows just how stark the losses are. The red areas represent ISIS-controlled territory in January of 2016, roughly 78,000 square kilometers. Compare that to data released today. Gains by Iraqi and Kurdish forces have reduced ISIS territory to a little more than 36,000 square kilometers. U.S. President Donald Trump stepped up his attack on the media today. He went after the hosts of a popular cable television morning show. But his language was so personal and so rude that several Republicans immediately denounced him. The CBC's Keith Bogue has the details. MSNBC's Morning Joe is enjoying its highest ratings ever. The hosts were once remarkably friendly with Donald Trump, but not since he became president. Nothing makes a man feel better than making a fake cover of a magazine about himself, lying every day and destroying the country. It's a good feeling. Trump claimed he wasn't watching this morning, but in a statement on social media, the president said, I heard poorly rated Morning Joe speaks badly of me. Don't watch anymore. 
Then how come low IQ crazy Mika, along with Psycho Joe, came to Mar-a-Lago three nights in a row around New Year's Eve and insisted on joining me? She was bleeding badly from a facelift. I said no. Horrified, Republicans punched back on Twitter. This has to stop, said Senator Susan Collins. Beneath the dignity of your office, said Senator Ben Sass. The president's statement represents what is wrong with American politics, said Senator Lindsey Graham. Like Trump's White House President staff Secretary defended him, Stephen saying when he gets hit, he hits back, and he's been hit often and unfairly by Morning Joe. The things they say, utterly stupid, personality disorder, mentally ill, constant personal attacks. Sarah Huckabee Sanders did not intend to criticize the president, but even she Iraq. seemed to understand it's something that he apparently does uh, not, that some jobs require turning the other cheek. I'm a woman, and I've been attacked by this show multiple times, but I don't cry foul because of it. Republican Republicans Alvin need to do more than say they're disappointed in Trump, said Republican strategist Anna and pundit Anna Navarro. It's time that somebody looks at the camera and looks at him and calls him up and says, listen, you crazy, lunatic, 70-year-old man, baby, stop it. You are now the president of the United States, the commander-in-chief, and you need to stop acting like a mean girl, because we just won't take it. Maybe somebody will say that to the president. But it would be a misunderstanding of today's lesson to think that the president is more likely to think carefully about that advice than to simply hit back at the person who gave it. Keith Oak, CBC News, Washington. Well, it's taken many months longer than he wanted, but with the U.S. Supreme Court's recent stamp of approval, Donald Trump's travel ban went into effect tonight. And while it is, for now, just a temporary measure, the opposition to it is as vigorous as ever. The CBC's Stephen D'Souza explains. At JFK in New York today, it was business as usual at international arrivals. It was a far cry from the scene in January, when protesters descended on Terminal 4 and dozens of lawyers camped out for days to help those blocked by Donald Trump's travel ban. One of the most encouraging With the latest version of the ban now in effect, lawyers are gearing up again. We are mobilized. We, we've been speaking with um, well over a thousand attorneys over the last few days that are prepared to be at the airports, that plan to be at the airport should anybody have any issues. The travel ban was one of Trump's key campaign promises. The first version was blocked by the courts. Version 2 was also blocked. But on Monday, the Supreme Court allowed parts of it to take effect before it hears the case in October. The travel restrictions apply to people from six predominantly Muslim countries. Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria and Yemen. The difference now, those who already have visas can get in. So too can travelers who can prove a bona fide relationship to the U.S. The State Department says that means immediate family, parents, a spouse, children, sons and daughters-in-law, and siblings. But grandparents, grandchildren, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, cousins don't count. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's, it's an attack on what family means, right? And it's clearly not what the Supreme Court intended. To honor the Trump administration contends the ban is about making the country safer. We'll be able to move forward. Not focusing on people from one religion or, or one culture and do a better job at, at determining who the person is that wants to come and why they want to come here. At the end of the day, this is really a, a targeted ban against a particular community, against the Muslim community, where they're excluding a particular population because of their religion. Experts say they don't expect as much chaos at the airports this time around. The drama will unfold at consulates overseas and in the courts, where lawyers are expected to challenge just what qualifies as a bona fide relationship. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. A shocking turn of events for the Vatican today. Cardinal George Pell, a top advisor to Pope Francis, has been charged with multiple sexual assaults in his native Australia. Police in the Australian state of Victoria say Pell faces multiple charges from his time as a county priest in the 1970s. Pell himself has long been a tireless crusader against sexual abuse by Catholic clergy. The Pope has granted Pell leave to travel home and defend himself. Brazilian police have arrested a young man for trying to ram his car into the official residence of President Michel Temer. Guards opened fire when the driver crashed through the gates and refused to stop. But in the end, nobody was hurt.
Tamer, whose approval rating sits at a mere 7%, was not in residence at the time. And people in Germany's capital got a taste of what many Canadians are struggling with this year. Intense flooding, heavy rains and thunderstorms overwhelmed whole sections of Berlin today, with streets looking more like rivers. Storms are expected to continue over the weekend. Straight ahead on The National, Hong Kong bristles under Chinese rule. That's Prince Charles winning fans in a Kalawit by offering greetings in a Nuktatut. He and Camilla began their three-day Canadian tour in the northern capital earlier today. It's Charles's 18th visit to Canada, but his first time in Nunavut since 1970, back when it was still part of the Northwest Territories. The Duke and Duchess of Cornwall enjoyed a very busy day, including lessons on Inuit languages and ancient practices. Then, after a traditional meal and a speech from the Premier, they flew south for Saturday's big Canada Day party in Ottawa. Another former British territory observes a big anniversary on Saturday as well. On July 1st, 1997, Britain transferred Hong Kong back to China after more than 150 years of colonial rule. Many hoped the dynamic open city would be a beacon of light for the rest of China to follow. But as Sasha Petrasik reports, 20 years on, that dream has dimmed. Hong Kong may be the most open place in China, but not today. The airport and the city were in a lockdown for the arrival of Chinese President Xi Jinping. Police guarded him and his sensibilities. Protest signs have been banned from his view. Xi calls this week's anniversary a happy event. We'll work with different parts of society, he says, to learn from the past 20 years how to give Hong Kong a stable future. But many here don't trust Beijing. Last night, protesters chained themselves to a monument symbolizing Chinese friendship. They demanded more freedom. Over the past years, these confrontations and arrests have increased as China moves to limit dissent. It wasn't supposed to be like this. When China agreed to respect Hong Kong's system 20 years ago, many even predicted that Hong Kong would change China. Democratic ideas and free speech would drift north, along with a more open economy. Instead, now, China seems to be changing Hong Kong. It's a recipe for more instability, says Anson Chan. She was Hong Kong's top civil servant when it was taken over by Beijing from the British. They don't no longer care about perception. They certainly do not care about what Hong Kong people think. Some here have even advocated independence. Beijing supporters say that's the real reason for China's assertiveness. You could criticize Chinese government or even the Communist Party, but if you go beyond that, that that red line to pursue the path of you know, independence, then they won't be tolerated. This week, very little is tolerated, but the activists on this rooftop keep painting. Still set on hanging pro-democracy banners, Xi Jinping will see. Sasha Petrasek, CBC News, Hong Kong. An unlikely attraction drew visitors to the Halifax Harbor this morning, a massive container ship. I've never seen a crowd like this for a container ship before. It was lined up along the pier, and even now there's still a fair amount of activity. The Zim Antwerp is 349 meters long and is the largest ship of its type to enter port. It's a busy week for the waters near Halifax. One of the world's largest cruise ships docked today. It hosts more than 4,000 passengers. Federal officials are in Prince Edward Island trying to determine the cause of death of at least six right whales. One of the whales was brought to shore so a necropsy can take place. It'll take several days to complete. Pathologists have noticed scarring on the whale's tail which could indicate a collision with a ship. Researchers want to study more whales on shore so results can be compared. Funny, friendly, caring, as long as you didn't mess with the number 99. Legendary Edmonton Oilers tough guy Dave Semenko has died. Gretzky, a pass in front, Coffee. Curry, score! 
Gretzky, Curry, Coffee, and Messier made the Oilers of the 80s a dominant force. But to dance, all that talent needed space. With his towering physicality, Dave Semenko gave them the room. Now we got Semenko and Howard. Semenko embraced the enforcer role, becoming a bodyguard for the great one. He would help the Oilers win two Stanley Cups. Those greats couldn't have done without the uh, support and, um, and, and aid of Dave Semenko. His death today came as a shock. It had been just three weeks since he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Dave Semenko was 59. Now, stay tuned for something special. Ah, uh, geez, Fred, I, I've told you that I hate doing the retirement things. There, you know, right Sorry, there. Peter, there's one more farewell coming up. A tribute to your decades in the field and on the national, bringing the news to Canadians wherever it happened. Let's check the day's business numbers. The TSX fell 142 points. The dollar edged up one quarter of a cent. In New York, the Dow tumbled nearly 168 points. And the price of oil closed up 19 cents a barrel. I've decided that this year will be my last one. I've let the CBC know that I'd like to step down from the national next July 1st. And here we are. In just a few days, Peter Mansbridge will be a retiree. The end of nearly 30 years as the voice of this program and as chief correspondent, the face of CBC News. For you, the viewers of The National, and for us, his colleagues, it is a big moment. And we want to take a few minutes tonight to say goodbye. We thought the best way to do that was to look at what we all share, his journalism. And we thought... Who better to do that than a former longtime colleague of Peter's who had a distinguished CBC News career of his own? Here's David Halton. How to capture a career nearly 50 years in the making. For Peter's, it helps that along the way the cameras were rolling. A life's work documented in real time. In other words, there's a record, and what a record it is. Stories, thousands of them, snapshots, bringing you back to specific times and places, a kaleidoscope of images, working backwards and forwards as memory does. Though let's state the obvious up front. Too much has happened to cover fully, as you know all too well. Because here's the thing, Peter's journalism is yours more than his. He helped report stories, you lived through them. In recalling his work, we reconnect with our own past and its seeming paradox. For all that has changed. Because it's 2015. And so dramatically at that there remains a fundamental Canadian continuity. If there's one area of the country Peter's career on, can be a touchstone for both. For that story, we'll start where he did. Scratchy radio reports from northern Manitoba, from a voice that would stitch itself into the Canadian fabric. Good evening. I'm Peter Mansbridge. I live in Churchill, the struggling northern town on the desolate shores of Hudson Bay. A first employment document gives no inkling of the career to come. Just another casual hire, use as needed for the radio service or on television. The sale was announced last week by the Minister of Public Works, Mr. Borowski. On the other side of this river is International Falls, Minnesota. Pretty soon, his beat covered Manitoba and Saskatchewan. But digging, sometimes in the dirt of local stories, got him noticed. Pig farming isn't an easy business. For one thing, it smells, and it smells a lot. The industry questions the dependability of future Saskatchewan potash deliveries. And so it was on to Ottawa, to a news bureau teeming with no-nonsense journalists. The start of a 40-year commitment to the story of Canadian politics. Peter, from the beginning, was a very good reporter. And he was especially a very good political reporter. And it now appears that atomic energy is being stonewalled by its own partner. 
On the question of when he might seek a new federal mandate for his views, Trudeau was as evasive as ever. He had an instinct, um, he had intelligence, and he had really a passion for figuring out how our system worked and the people in the system were fascinating to him. And instead of asking you which way you'll go on the vote, do you agree with the idea of petrol can being the sole import of oil? Well, if you look back in the... Federal elections were the centerpiece, and on that score, Peter's role changed through the years. And go out and make the nation grow. The final days of this campaign will keep Clark in B.C. for most of the weekend. At first, he followed leaders on the campaign trail. Pretty soon, he was working in the election night studio, feeding information to Knowlton Nash. Is it really true that Jack Hare, the Conservatives, occasionally has campaigned in a bunny suit? That's what I hear. He's also campaigned in uh, roller skates, running shoes. The Liberal is, is not much different. He, he goes out on the... Uh, he goes out on bridges in St. Boniface and stands up and waves at the cars as they go by with his sign. I'm Knowlton Nash for CBC News. Good night. After Knowlton retired, Peter, as chief correspondent, began to drive CBC's election coverage himself. I'm Peter Mansbury. Let's bring you right up to date. David Halton, our chief political correspondent, has watched a lot of elections. Peter David, on election night was amazing to watch. He knows exactly what question to ask at what time. He knows exactly when to interrupt. He knows exactly when to let the story play out. Having seen the Atlanta Canada results, and I agree with you, they've got to lose a lot of seats to be in real trouble here tonight. But one of the things... It that is like watching Glenn Gould play. <laughs> Through it all, as one Prime Minister gave way to the next. Great scandal, Mrs. Speaker. In defending our record. Their time is up. I would ask the member to try to restrain themselves. A singular theme was constant. Politics matter. Peter understands why there's a lot of cynicism about politics, but I think he fights not to be cynical about politics. And I think that's right. That's staggeringly high on Part of the job was to question those leaders on behalf of Canadians, at first alongside yours truly. You're just months away from an election. We don't know. Later, on his own. What our involvement would be in Afghanistan. Not somebody who believes in term limits. <laughs> I think term limits are up to the voter. Gotcha journalism was never the point. Public service was. That's why the Ad Issue panel exists. Peter created it because he thinks politics is important and because he thinks Canadians shouldn't just be viewers or become cynical of politics, but understand it a little bit better. From regional battles over resources, the economy and government funding to Quebec's role in the Constitution. Here's the scene at the Yes Side headquarters, the dejection on their faces of coming so close. News magazine. For Canada's failure of its indigenous population <laughs> to the revolution on Canada's political right. This party address issues of language and immigration. Is there a right and wrong anymore on the deficit issue? And what's the advice here to David Johnson? That because issue sure has helped drive Canada's political the, conversation. The of the government of Canada. Politics may have had its moments since the 1970s. But for a story of dramatic change felt by Canadians everywhere, can anything rival the revolution in technology? The electronic web, the threat to privacy in the computer age. At the CBC, this worked on two levels. First, it was an ongoing source of news. Tonight on Quarterly Report, a look at the dark side of the information revolution. Well, it appears Facebook has lived up to its commitment to address privacy concerns. As much as devices are the lifeblood for Canadians today, it's easy to forget that not long ago they were novelties. Well, there's a revolution going on in rec rooms, offices and classrooms around the world through a computer network called Internet. It's the little gadget that can. The iPhone is causing a buzz. But inside the CBC, tech was more than a story. Computers, software, mobile phones, changed the way the journalism got done. What didn't change was Peter's role in making the program. Peter is a journalist. National went on the air at 9 o'clock. He didn't walk in at 
and say, well, oh, very nice, and, and go out and read it. You gotta try to sell the lobster story without making it sound like a lobster story. I'll, I'll tell you what was interesting about our coverage, as opposed to everybody else's coverage, is we dealt with what the options were. And we explained it. His involvement so always extended to supporting reporters in the field. There's a sense here that the ground Just is about shifted. all Cubans. You can see the extent of the devastation. It was a day of anger. Florida is shouting. absolutely critical Peter, to the outcome. Peter, people in are used to the occasion. Ukraine's new president promised Well, that a is get will become the 12th First Nations community to be I mean, put it's, under it's that sort of point. It's weird on TV, right? It's weird about the way you look, the way you dress, the way you talk. And he has been so good about saying, I don't care. I just, I just want you to be comfortable, and I just want you to be you from someone like him, for somebody like me, ha has meant kind of the world. It's sort of given me permission to, to just uh, ease into who I am and, and to be comfortable. He is a very powerful force. Uh, understand, it's not easy to stand up to Peter Mansbridge, but he wanted you to. He wanted to discuss what the National would look like. What he wanted it to look like was a public broadcaster. So when Peter got the job, I phoned him up to congratulate him, and he said to me, I'm thinking of what I should say on my sign-off, and here's what I'm thinking. Thank you for watching. And I thought, that's perfect. Because Peter had always been someone, and is always someone, who really sees the audience as part of journalism, as part of what journalism is about. This was a five-story building. What people don't know, whether there's anybody alive in there. Peter believed in showing the hard stories. 15,000 came in just the latest wave. This is what starvation looks like in the capital, Juba. Take the recent coverage of the humanitarian crisis in South Sudan. It's really a hard thing to look at. And no one tells a story like that better than Margaret, you know, with the compassion of that. And Peter saw that and he elevated it and he said, we will lead with this, not once, not twice, three times this week. This is what our place is as a public broadcaster and we will be heard on this. Those people in South Sudan will be heard. Wow, this is freezing. This is just cold air blowing through here. You got a lot of mold in here. He pushed for the difficult Canadian stories as well. So for Canadians who've been wondering why aren't some of the neediest in Attawapiskat already in those new homes, what's the holdup? From places like Attawapiskat, where desperately needed change is too slow to arrive, to a broadcast of a national from an icebreaker in the Northwest Passage, where unwanted change is happening too fast. Tonight on our program, we'll look at the science of climate change and the science of Arctic sovereignty that's so critical for Canada's claims here inside the Arctic Circle. To show Canada to Canadians was the idea behind road stories like that one. Over the years, this country's map has been dotted by the arrival of the national crew, Peter in tow, ready with a take on the day's burning regional issue, giving the rest of Canada a closer look. Of course, dramatic changes overseas mattered to Canadians as well. In the late 70s, the Vietnamese boat people rocked the world's conscience. Well, the people on this boat seem pretty happy now. They've made their long journey in from Vietnam. The joy of this moment could be short-lived, because what's ahead is refugee camps that are squalid, that are overcrowded, and that are full of uncertain people. A decade later, Berlin's iconic wall seized global attention. The numbers of those coming over from East Germany are staggering. More than two million are said to have come over to taste what has been forbidden for 28 years. It gets me a chance to just go up north where they spend a little bit of action. Peter went to Afghanistan where Canadians were fighting and dying, partly in aid of a fledgling democracy. Voter registration in this country is painfully slow. So far, less than 10% of the country's 10 million eligible voters have registered, less than 2% of women. Over the years, Peter spent less time in the field, but he continued to break stories, like the night Pierre Trudeau died. And I said, well, that's a pretty good story. And I got the network to come to us. That is to say, I told Master Control, and again in a... In this day and age, I know this will be hard to believe, but the program I took off the air to put the death of Pierre Trudeau on was the Olympics. I pulled the Olympics off the air. 
on Peter Mansbridge's word that Pierre Trudeau had died. Here is a bulletin from CBC News. Hello from Toronto, I'm Peter Mansbridge. Just moments ago, the Right Honourable Pierre Elliott Trudeau passed away. And he said, I sure hope we're right about this. And I said to him, well, if it's not right, it's our last story we're ever going to do, so I hope we enjoy the night. Gordy Howe, Mr. Hockey, has died aged 88. Peter helped inform viewers of many important passings. After months of illness, Mandela died today. Short and tragic life of Diana, Princess of Wales. People whose lives, work or values held special meaning for Canadians. Thanks for your joy. We all know that Mr. Layton has been fighting a battle with cancer. Uh, we've learned that uh, he passed away. And whose deaths inspired a collective pause. Programs normally seen at this time have been... None more so than that of Terry Fox. But the past 12 months has brought us a new kind of courage and dedication in the form of a young man who suddenly made us realize that no goal is too great to be reached for and that no dream is too great to be imagined. Part of Peter's job is finding the right words, the right tone. Just for those who are just joining us, video of the second uh, attack on the uh, World Trade Center by a hijacked aircraft. Especially in times of crisis, when the facts are uncertain. On a day like 9-11, when you couldn't do homework, because we had never seen this before, and yet uh, he did what exactly what you'd want your anchor to do. Be calm, be serious, understand what was going on, put things in context. Uh, within 90 minutes from that point, both towers had collapsed under the uh, strain of the damage that had been done structurally to both towers. And obviously, the resulting damage is it's just almost too hard to comprehend. From that day forward, acts of global terrorism and the responses to them have changed the way we see the world. When Parliament Hill itself came under attack, Peter steered CBC News's understated coverage. And there's kind of a security area there. Now, whether that's where the first shooting took place or not, I don't know. But clearly, the gunman got past there, because we can see it on that video shot by the Globe. It's hard to know when to stop looking back. The range of stories matches the lived events. Hello, I'm Mark Garneau. This country's participation in the reach for the stars. As a nine-year-old kid, thinking that someday maybe I might have a chance to fly in space. Our devotion to the national game. Canada, you've got another gold. Canada wins gold in overtime. The evolution in the acceptance of love in all its forms. artistry of musicians proudly exported to the world. The got to your house this morning. How deeply their work and their lives touches here at home. Until the next time, Gord. <laughs> we need a little kiss. Yeah. <laughs>
I wish it were worth a little more, that's my opinion, but I think a coin's fine. Bills get dirty and they're not very pleasant to handle. Coin's better. The year was 1987, and that was one forward-looking woman. Canada's $1 coin had just been introduced, and the truth is, a lot of people frowned on this big change, so to speak. 30 years later, the loony is a global symbol of Canada and part of our vocabulary, but the image and the nickname happened almost by accident. Renee Filipponi has the story. It's now synonymous with Canada. Slang for our dollar an image recognized around the world. A new dollar, the mint. Three decades ago, it was just an idea. And love for the loony was, well, a little more tempered. I think the dollar coin is too heavy to carry around. I think I'd rather keep the dollar because, I don't know, nice color. <laughs> Coins don't wear out as fast as bills. And that's the reason why Canada said goodbye to the $1 bill. The plan was to use old dyes or molds from a silver dollar coin that had been produced for decades for the new coin. Those dyes were shipped from here at the Ottawa Mint facility to Winnipeg, but they never made it. They were either stolen or lost in transit, and they've never been recovered. In order to prevent counterfeiting, the Mint ordered a new design. In a panic to get the coin made on time for June 30th, 1987, the Mint chose an image that had been in its art bank for nearly a decade. And everyone will be able to possess a copy of it, uh, whether they want to or not, really. And he was right. Almost immediately, the dollar coin was nicknamed the loony. At first a joke, now a term of endearment. It became a piece of Canadian lore. After a loony was hidden at center ice at the 2002 Salt Lake Winter Olympics as a good luck charm. Gold medal game, folks. Both Canadian teams took home gold. So, goodbye dollar bills. Okay. Hello loonies. It's that history in part that's drawn collector Stephen Adams in. I love the design. I love the way it connects us to the past. Look in your pocket and you may come across an original 1987 loony. Adams says they are easy to find because so many were made. But some mintings of the coin are impossible to find. Between 97 and 2001, there were no circulation strikes made for loonies, and mostly it was cost-saving measure. Meanwhile, the government has officially changed the design of the new coin. It's but remember, the loon design was never part of the initial plan. This was what the $1 coin was supposed to be designed with. It's called the Voyageur. And to commemorate the anniversary, the Mint is printing a special edition for Canada 150. I can do it such a Canadian scene, you know, like, and also you have uh, the indigenous people with the French people there. So it's, it's, it, it tells a story. So if those voyageur dies were never lost, well, the loony wouldn't be a loony, a mistake that's found its way into the Canadian story, like it or not. It's a part of us. When we're talking about money, you don't think of it as a $1 piece. You think of it as the loony. That's all that it is. In a short 30 years, it's joined the ranks of the beaver and the maple leaf as a symbol of this nation. Many today don't know a Canada without it. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Ottawa. And coming up, this is a big weekend for Canada. We'll show you what we've got lined up for tomorrow night's national on the eve of the country's big birthday. I'm Mike Finnerty. Tomorrow on the summer edition of The Current, with Canada Day just around the corner, what Canadians are doing to celebrate the country's 150th birthday. Snapshots of a celebration on the summer edition of The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. We want to correct a mistake from last night's program. Rex Murphy gave the wrong year for when Newfoundland officially joined Confederation. It actually happened on March 31st, 1949. CBC News will broadcast from Ottawa all day on July 1st, but Peter will be there a day early for his final edition of The National. Here's a preview. After some final tweaks and tinkering on Saturday, this will be the place to be. Parliament Hill for Canada 150 will be a Canada Day in Ottawa you won't want to miss. If you can't be there, we'll take you there, starting with the National tomorrow night.
We'll cover all angles of the story, including an acknowledgement that not everyone is celebrating. It was definitely awkward for us. But instead of boycotting the event, Vancouver figured out how the city could get involved. If we're going to focus on Indigenous people's contributions to this country, we also have to acknowledge that we are older than just 150. We are 150 plus. And does this place look familiar? If you know Downton Abbey, you know these castle walls. But did you know that maybe, just maybe, there would be no Canada were it not for this place. I thought, how lucky are we to have something so momentous taking place in this library? And when the big July 1st party is over, what comes next? Where should Canada be heading? We asked three young politicians who already have their fingertips on the pulse of Canadians. I want to try and get some sense of how you see the need for this country to change. That's all tomorrow night on The National from Ottawa. And that's The National for this Thursday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Carol McNeil, and to borrow a line from Peter Mansbridge, thanks for watching. Good night.